Welcome to the 40th anniversary event of the Pascal Lectures thank you, on Christianity and Literature at the University of Waterloo. I'm going to read you a portion of the description of the Pascal Lectures when they were founded by the, by the Board of Governors of the University of Waterloo back in 1978. So here it is. Blaise Pascal, 1623 to 62, the 17th century French academic and Christian, is remembered today as a forerunner of Newton in his establishment of the calculus and as the author of Christian meditations, Les Pensées. Members of the University of Waterloo, wishing to understand, to, wishing to establish a forum for the presentation of Christian issues in an academic environment have chosen to commemorate the spirit of Pascal by this annual event. The Pascal lectures bring to the University of Waterloo outstanding individuals of international repute who have distinguished themselves in both scholarly endeavor and Christian thought or life. These individuals discourse with the university community on some aspect of its own world, its theories, its research, its leadership role in our society, challenging the university to search for truth through personal faith and intellectual inquiry which focus on Jesus Christ. I've read that from this book called A Christian Critique of the University. It was written by the first of our speakers 40 years ago, whose name was Charles Malik. Charles Malik's son is alive, Habib Malik, and in Lebanon. Charles, Mal Charles Malik is perhaps the most prestigious international academic who has ever visited the University of Waterloo. He was the president of the Security Council of the United Nations. He chaired the Committee of the United Nations which established the International Declaration of Human Rights. He was one of the signatories of the peace treaty with Japan on shipboard Mid-Pacific, 1945. He received over 50 honorary doctorates from around the world and uh, has had more influence on myself and my academic life than any other of the remarkable people that I've had the privilege of speaking with and sitting under and listening to. Since that time, the Pascal Lectures have, bought, have brought 33 speakers, we've missed seven years. They have been men and women, they have been from the humanities, the sciences, and, the, and uh, mathematics, and engineering. They've been from Asia, from Europe, from the United Kingdom, from the USA, from Canada. A truly remarkable group of human people. If you look up the Pascal Lectures site on the University of Waterloo, you will see a list of their names, and for many of these, you can hear their lectures. Two of our most recent lectures, John Lennox and uh, the great James Tour, second most well-known chemist in North America, have between them had over 90,000 visits to the Pascal Lecture Series which they have given. It's a great contribution to the community at the University of Waterloo. And beyond that, for these people around the world to have access to the Pascal Lecture Series in this most remarkable of universities. We are grateful that this Christian Lecture Series is not only founded by, but welcome in the University of Waterloo. Of course, there are times when there have been protests that we exist, the Pascal Lectures. But as Professor Knuth said just in the other day, well, that's all the more reason to know that the Pascal Lectures are needed. And I agree with him. So today, Donald Knuth is our speaker. Thanks to Donald Knuth, 
I myself am able to do all my research on the computer. Before he came along, it wasn't possible. He was telling me in the car on the way over that there were a few people, published a journal, managed to get eight volumes out, called Computing in the Humanities in Paris. But that's about all. So, from myself and on behalf of all the others of us who are in the humanities and whose research and academic life depends so heavily, is enriched so much by the computer, thank you, Professor Knuth. So now, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Donald Knuth. Come, Don. Well, it, thank you very much, John. For, it's a great honor for me to be the first Pascal lecturer who's actually been asked to come back and speak again. Uh, I, John didn't mention this, but uh, uh, 16, 17 years ago, uh, I was honored the first time to be a Pascal lecturer, and I thoroughly enjoyed my time in Waterloo then. It's comforting to know that the, co uh, the committee apparently believes that I still haven't run out of relevant things to say. Uh, well, we'll see. Make, let's hope that they were right. The Pascal lectures at Waterloo, it's a wonderful tradition, as John said, goes back 40 years now, because they cut across academic disciplines. Computer science is my specialty, and I love computer science, but I'm well aware that computer science isn't everything. A university isn't simply a collection of people in their own ivory towers confined to their own specialties. A university can celebrate all aspects of life, and the Pascal Lectures were established to promote meaningful discussions of interaction between personal faith and intellectual inquiry. I wish Stanford had something like this. Furthermore, the, in the invitation to revisit your campus came at a perfect time for me because I had just completed a multi-year project that I think makes a perfect example of, exa of how the ideas from many different communities fit together nicely. Namely, I recently had the good fortune to fulfill a lifelong dream to compose a non-trivial piece of music. We all know that music has mystical qualities mystical qualities that are deeply connected to human emotions in ways that may never be well understood. Music is part of our inner selves. Everywhere we look, we see that music has a profound effect on nearly everybody's lives, and history tells us that this has been going on for centuries. I looked up the titles of the Pascal Lectures from the past 40 years, and curiously, I didn't see any mention of music. So I figure it's not a bad idea to add music to the mix this year. I've always loved music, and ever since my student days, I've been hoping that someday I'd be able to write a piece of music that would have a positive influence on many of the people who heard it. Here's a, uh, uh, Leibniz once famously said that music is a secret exercise in the arithmetic of the soul, unaware of its act of counting. Notice that he's connecting arithmetic, which is totally precise and mechanical, with the mystery of a human soul. As a computer scientist, uh, let me say first of all, that I'm very pleased when I can totally surround some technical subject to the point where I know everything about that subject because of airtight, logic, airtight logical reasoning. But I'm also very grateful for life's mysteries, for concepts that are beyond human comprehension, concepts that allow me to learn more and more day after day, yet never to reach the end. If there were no mystery, everything would be cut and dried. Life would be hopelessly boring. Second, <clears throat> ever since my first encounter with computers, I've considered the practice of writing programs uh, to be an art form. The very first sentence of my book, The Art of Computer Programming, ex explains this. This comes from uh, 1968. Well, <clears throat> the process of pre preparing programs for a digital computer is especially attractive 
not only because it can be economically and scientifically rewarding, but also because it can be an aesthetic experience, much like composing poetry or music. Yes, programming is very much like composing music, like writing music. Thirdly, the programs that I, that I wrote at first during my early years, they were intended to do scientific things. I wrote programs that were supposed to discover properties of prime numbers, programs that were searching for patterns in large bodies of data, and so on. The artistic aspect of those programs was simply that I wanted to express them in an elegant and appealing style. I didn't want to waste time on unnecessary computation. I didn't want to use clumsy approaches. Good style is artistic. But later on, I began to write programs in which the actual objective, the thing being computed, was itself artistic. What I mean is, I wasn't just looking for patterns, I was looking for beautiful patterns. For example, I began in 1979 to write a program called Metafont, which by now is used to create the majority of all letter forms that are used in today's publications about physics and mathematics. Uh, you know, I bet Donna Strickland herself has been influenced by Metafon. Here uh, is the example that, me that, Metafon, uh, uh, that uses Metafon to draw the letter pi. So I don't expect you to understand this program, but the point is that this is complete instructions for how to make that, character, that image that you see there. And, um, and the point is, I'm not computing, this is not a program to compute the ratio between the circumference of a circle and a diameter of a circle. Here I'm computing the pixels uh, that will tell a printing machine where to put ink in order to make the shape, the shape of the letter pi. On the other hand, if you look real close at this code, you'll notice that the number 3.14159 actually is used four times during the calculation. Until recently, that has been my little secret. Thousands of physicists and mathematicians write papers about pi every day, uh, uh, every week, let's say, without realizing that 3.14159 is an integral part of its design. <clears throat> In a similar way, you can see that it's natural to write computer programs whose goal is to write a stimulating piece of music. So I'm going to give several examples of that later, but first let me tell you about the music project that had been haunting me ever since the 1960s. <clears throat> when I was a grad student at Caltech, early 1960s, a biochemistry professor named Walter Schroeder taught a Bible class based on the biblical book of Revelation. Uh, you probably know that Revelation, the last book in the Bible, is a mystical book which has been interpreted over the years in many wildly different ways. I was fascinated to learn that the author of Revelation had frequently used numbers with symbolic meanings. Uh, for example, the number three represented God. Four represented the world. Seven represented perfection or God's interaction with the world. There were coded meetings in Revelation for three and a half, and for 10, 12, 24, many others, including the notorious number 666. The book of Revelation also includes a wide variety of non-numerical symbols, symbols like candlesticks, horses, scrolls, seals, trumpets, bowls, beasts, horns, and so on. And they recur repeatedly, and they're mixed up with the numbers in very interesting ways. Now, at the same time I was learning about Revelation, I was a member of our church choir. One of my very favorite anthems was a beautiful piece by Paul Montz called In So Lord Jesus Quickly Come. It's based on the book of Revelation and it was written when Montz's young son was seriously ill. So an idea came to me. Maybe it would be possible to write a piece of music that incorporates the numbers and the other symbols of Revelation following the same exact sequence of numbers and symbols that occurs in the original text. Furthermore, at the end of such a piece, I could quote the, 
the, desight, the delightful theme from Even So, Lord Jesus, Quickly Come. I actually discussed this idea with Paul Mounts himself, uh, who happens to be the cousin of, my aunt, of one of my aunts. And he kindly applauded the idea. Well, many years later, I learned that this idea of, of, uh, of, of, of tr trying to translate Revelation into music wasn't entirely new. The very first full-length commentary on the book of Revelation, uh, written by Victorinus of, of Poetovio in about 270 AD, uh, this commentary remarked admiringly that Revelation resembled a piece of music in that its repetitions of symbols and themes don't simply unfold in straight lines. As I say, this idea haunted me for a long time. Finally, on Thanksgiving Day in 2011, uh, I mean the US version of Thanksgiving Day, it comes a little later than yours, I decided to do something about it, and I started to keep notes in a little book, a, a little French-style cahier. And here's what I wrote on the, type, on the first page of that book. In this book, I plan to jot down thoughts for a project that may be crazy, but a muse has been encouraging me to embark upon it for more than 40 years. I hope to be able to write a piece of organ music that's based on the text of the apocalypse, the mystical book of Revelation, using the basic philosophy that constraints help to create great art. I'm intrigued by the fact that so many artists and writers have been inspired by these words for nearly 2,000 years by now. Thus, I can't resist the thought that perhaps I too might be led by these ancient words to create something that may be newly meaningful to people of the 21st century. So now uh, it was time for me to get to work at the end of 2011. How did I start? I spent uh, several months compiling data building computer files that would help me. For example, I, I downloaded the original Greek text of Revelation, and I made some concordances that showed all of its words and where they were used. I uh, downloaded some English translations too, of course, because my knowledge of Greek isn't that great. I read many commentaries about the book. I searched for musical compositions that had already been written based on particular verses of Revelation. In fact, I actually found nearly 100 such musical works. <clears throat> the hardest part of this starting phase was to come up with a list of the key symbolic concepts, uh, the key sort of atomic tokens for which I wanted to supply musical equivalents. <clears throat> After making several passes over the text, I came up with about 250 candidates. Eventually, this list was boiled down to just 167 that turned out to be sufficiently important. So let me call this 167 the elements from which uh, the author had woven his narrative. Uh, for example, if we, if we zoom in on the complete list of elements, uh, uh, we can see that uh, uh, the elements that begin with the letter T are <clears throat> temple, 10, thanks, three, three and a half, throne, thunder, torment, trampling, <coughs> true, trumpet, and 12. Now the Greek text of Revelation has almost exactly 10,000 words. <coughs> My original goal was to use it as the basis for about 45 minutes worth of music. Doing the math, that meant I essentially had to cover about 3.7 words per second. Scholars had long ago broken the text of Revelation into 22 chapters, involving a total of 404 verses. So I had to write about 6.7 seconds worth of music for each verse. I made a great big cross index in my computer so that if for every verse, I knew exactly which elements occurred in that verse and whether anybody had already set that verse to music. Uh, for example, my index for chapter two, verse 10, listed the following elements, crown, day, death, faith, fear, life, Satan, and tribulation, together with the fact that Mendelssohn had been inspired by this verse when he wrote section 40 of his oratorial, Paulus. 
uh, you can see from the, the list of these elements that Revelation gets into weighty themes. In fact, it covers the whole gamut of human emotion. Now it was time to get to work and assign musical motifs uh, to each. But before I, oh, oh, never mind. It's time to um, get to work and assign musical motifs to each of those 167 elements. Now that process took more than a year because, of course, I, I needed to match things up one at a time. I, I couldn't start out and say, okay, arbitrarily, here's my assignment of, of motif to uh, element one, element two, and so on. Uh, I, I wanted to make them all blend together and make a decent piece of music. Um, so uh, I didn't want to make any rash judgments that would, that would spoil things. My, my knowledge of graph theory, which of course is one of the great specialties of the University of Waterloo, um, <clears throat> helped me to find a decent ordering of the elements so that I could make these assignments uh, sequentially, one by one, remaining musically compatible with the previous choices uh, quite, quite well as the composition was slowly taking shape. So for example, I, I decided to plunge in with chapter 16, verse 3, and in that verse there were just four major elements, angel, bowl, wrath, and blood. It turns out that angel actually occurs in 47 different verses, so it's an especially important element. Now, at that time, I was working hard on something completely different. It was a major computer program called SAT-13, which was an important com component of new material for um, the art of computer programming. But in odd moments, the music for Revelation 16.3 just sort of came to me, and I liked it. Now I'm going to go over to the piano, and I'm going to give some musical uh, uh, you know, explanations of what I'm talking about. And, uh, and then John is going to come over here and, and, and we're going to set up a, a relay system because he's going to be my slide changer. My, my remote, you know, I'm, I'm the remote control and he's, and he's the changer. So, okay, so the first thing I noticed is, so I've got, I, I, I've got to uh, I start out writing this piece and, and, and I'm starting out in chapter 16, verse 3. Uh, and I have to, have to have a motif for angel. Well, I, I noticed that eight note arpeggios would make an excellent motif uh, for angels. So, at, at the beginning of uh, Tchaikovsky's Waltz of the Flowers, he's got the harp playing arpeggios up, going up 16 notes and then down 16 notes. So I realized I could dwell on arpeggios uh, for angels in different ways throughout my piece as it, at, you know, at, in the different contexts in which angels appear. Well, then I worked out motif for bowl and wrath and blood. A bowl, for instance, keeps something confined inside the bowl, but th then the contents spill out. I don't have time to explain the details except to mention that the idea for blood was suggested by my wife. Uh, she observed that blood coagulates, therefore I could indicate blood by using clusters of notes. That's blood, okay. So, two down and 165 to go. <clears throat> now, uh, 167 motifs eventually chosen have many different forms. Some of them uh, are based on specific melodies. For example, uh, you won't be surprised to know that one of the most important of all is the motif for God, which is the three note theme that used to mean NBC in, in America, but anyway, so, so now God has three aspects, so when the context refers to God as creator, I emphasize the first note. On the other hand, God as Messiah um, is rendered, for example, and God um, as spirit would be saying, okay, so, so when God appears, uh, uh, th that gives me, uh, you know, po musical possibilities and, and also emphasizing some aspect of God. Revelation also features a corresponding anti-trinity, a three-phase devil whose motif is the God theme played backwards and with a so-called tritone infiltrating what had been a major triad. So this is the devil. The 
three corresponding characters for this anti-trinity in Revelation are called the beast, who is, um, and then there's the dragon, that's and um, the false prophet. And false prophet, of course, is the, okay, you got the idea. Uh, some of the motifs instead of melodies are based on rhythms, not melodies. So, for example, uh, there's a double dotted rhythm, which is, uh, which is traditionally used for royalty. So, as in Mozart's Rex uh, Tremendi. When you write that musical notation, you use double dots on the, on the longer note. <clears throat> Um, some of the motifs are harmonic. Uh, for example, the motif for man is a Tristan chord. Servant is a Petrushka chord. Okay. okay. Petrushka chord. Now, uh, as I say, in this, in this uh, I mean, by the way, in this connection, I can't help mentioning Blaise Pascal's own comment about musical harmony. This is what Pascal said. Too many concords are annoying in music. So in other words, he's saying we got to have those dissonant Tristan and Petrushka chords. <clears throat> Some of the motifs are musical idioms. I mentioned that angel is an arpeggio. Uh, grace is a grace note. And woman is an appoggiatura. Some of the motifs that I chose are musical basics. Woe, for example, is a blues scale. <clears throat> the 24 elders, a chromatic scale. 24. <clears throat> um, lion is an octatonic scale. The motif for sweet and sour are major and minor. Uh, prophet is contrary motion. Sun is a palindrome. Actually, uh, go ahead. Uh, you, you, you take care of that all written. So, yeah, blues scale, chromatic scale, octatonic. Sour is uh, you know, major key, minor key. Contrary motion for a prophet. Palindrome for the sun, it goes up, go up and down. And uh, gold is, is uh, indicated by, by close harmony. <clears throat> now, of course, 167 is a pretty big number. My project still needed motifs galore. <clears throat> it was um, a pleasant exercise to assign them one at a time as the pieces of the puzzle came together. <clears throat> I decided to base some of the motifs on trigrams of the ancient Chinese Yi Ching. <clears throat> So heaven, for example, is up, up, up. And earth is down, down, down. And fire is up, down, up. Uh, water is down, 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 up, down. And when I'm using this from the Yi Ching, it's flexible. The actual interval by which to go up or down isn't specified, so I can adjust that to suit the context. Some of the motifs come from nature. Uh, for example, lamb, which, is, which occurs very frequently in the book, is a bleeding sound. Ba. Horse is a whinny. Some of the effects are, effect, uh, some of the motifs are effects that are only attainable on a pipe organ. Uh, for example, the motif for star it is it symbol stern? Stern, <laughs> a delightful circle of little bells often found on German instruments. Uh, the the, the symbol stern often plays at Christmas time. Name is a pedal point. That's a bass note that we hold, and then we have um, some mel melody going on in the top. But name, uh, the, the bass note is the motif of, for, for name. <clears throat> 
Uh, okay. Uh, there, uh, I, I'm saying things that, that are specific to the organ. So, so open and close, um, I, I can represent but this by opening and closing the boxes that surround the pipes of the organ. So now let's see how this applies uh, to the beginning of chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6 is, the famous, is where the famous four horsemen of the apocalypse enter the story. Here's the original Greek text of, uh, at, at, of the beginning of chapter 6 <clears throat> with Eng English at the bottom. <clears throat> then I saw the lamb break open the first of the seven seals. And I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice that sounded like thunder, come. I looked and there was a white horse. Its rider held a bow and he was given a crown. He rode out as a conqueror to conquer, end quote. So the main elements in these two verses are lamb, open, seal, creature, voice, thunder, come, white, horse, crown, conquer, uh, 11 of them in uh, that order, and I wanted to convert those 11 into decent music. I knew that, I already knew the motifs for lamb and horse and open. What about seal? Well, I decided that a dozen of the motifs in my translation ought to invoke the styles of great composers. Furthermore, I decided that seal should we allude to Jehan Alain, because it turned out that Alain had written a wonderful piece called Les Jardins Suspendus, whose theme blends perfectly with a bleeding lamb and with the idea of opening up the organ pipes. So um, I had a good uh, start. This is the manuscript from the beginning of chapter six. And uh, you see the bleeding in the left hand and, uh, and then uh, this open, that means open the, open the box around the pipes. <clears throat> the right hand plays the last theme, the left hand plays the lamb's call. The slow box opens, and then there's thunder in the pedals while the first creature says, come. Well, here's, here's how it sounds. Can we, can we hear now uh, the, or the organ music? Okay, so, so the, the melody in the left hand that you just heard is, is we shall overcome. That melody is the motif for conquer. I, now, in those two verses, I wasn't able to handle all 11 of the uh, elements, uh, but there wasn't in time to get voice or crown in there. But the, all the other nine are there. So uh, you're, now you're no doubt thinking, how on earth is the listener supposed to know what's going on without memorizing all 167 motifs? Good question. I forgot to mention that from the very beginning, I had conceived of my piece, which I, which I, 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 I guess in the title you can guess, it's called Fantasia Apocalyptica. I had envisioned Fantasia Apocalyptica as a multimedia work with several video tracks being projected while the organist is playing. You know, after all, this is the 21st century and, and we've got uh, music videos all over the place. So, <clears throat> so one of those video tracks displays the text of Revelation that's being followed just in Greek and in English, as you uh, saw. Another video track displays the music that the organist is playing. And I commissioned Dwayne Bibby uh, to make 100 drawings that illustrate the story. Well, Dwayne's brilliant artwork is displayed on a third video track. So, for example, uh, here's his picture of the lamb. His, his artwork is so stunning, in fact, I decided a few months ago that it really ought to be published in a book. And I'm happy to announce that the book, Fantasia Apocalyptica Illustrated, just came out this month. And the first copies have just arrived in Waterloo last week. Uh, this book is designed so that you can turn the pages while listening to the music Therefore, 
getting the full multimedia experience. So let me play those bars again while displaying the, the three visual aids as they appear in the book so that you can get an idea of my intentions. Can we hear, hear clip one again? Okay, so Revelation is a mystical book, and my goal is for the listener, watcher, uh, to experience the mystical qualities, not to fully understand it. Indeed, I don't think anybody really understands Revelation or ever will. On each reading or hearing, however, we can penetrate a bit further into its mysteries, and I really think that that's the point. It's totally unnecessary to know about any of those 167 motifs but they turn out to be meaningful and stimulating if you learn more and more of them as time goes on. Now, uh, also, uh, uh, I mentioned Metafont a few minutes ago, and, it, and, it, and a, uh, I got a wonderful surprise uh, uh, about 17 years ago. I got a letter, a package in the mail from, from Germany, from the University of Mainz, uh, uh, which, where, of course, Gutenberg uh, uh, did his pioneer work in printing, and there's, there's a professor of art there who was very entranced by Metafont, and he decided that it was that, it, that uh, this would get, this he would be able to uh, uh, represent the Book of Revelation for the first time the way he ought, think it ought to be done, uh, using Metafont to to create artwork, and so he sent me. Uh, 22 pieces of art, which you can see in the hallways around here. Uh, and at the top of each piece, it, you can see uh, not it, the original text, not in, uh, not in Greek, but in, in Luther's translation into German. And then uh, each page itself is, it is his mystical uh, rendering of those same words using metaphor to, to create a, a, uh, an abstract pattern that uh, reflects the mystery of, the, of, of, of each chapter. <clears throat> Now, um, I mentioned a, middle, a minute ago that a dozen of the motifs in my translation pay homage to the styles of great composers. Uh, here's a complete list. Seal, as I said, uh, is, is for Elan. Truth alludes uh, to Bach. Mighty to Beethoven. Voice, Borodin. Throne, Brubeck. Cloud, Debussy. Word is Frank. Temple, Gershwin. Book, Hindemith, Worship, at Messiah, and uh, Blasphemy, Schoenberg. Let me uh, tell you a little bit more about Blasphemy. Arnold Schoenberg was famous for his so-called 12-tone music, in which the listener can't distinguish one key from another. A uh, so-called 12-tone row is a permutation of the 12 possible pitches. <laughs> Uh, any permutation of those pitches is a 12-tone row, and an all-interval 12-tone row has an additional property that none of the intervals between consecutive notes is the same, mod 12. In other words, each of the 12 possible notes occurs exactly once in a 12-tone row, and each of the 11 possible intervals between adjacent notes also occurs exactly once. Now, that's a nice little mathematical problem. It's a nice computer science problem. And it has uh, nearly uh, 250 essentially different solutions. That about 250 different uh, uh, all interval 12 tone rows. I chose the, the solution that Derek Lamer considered to be the most perfect of all, which is this one. Uh, because it has some nice symmetry. So here's how um, that one sounds in chapter 13. Chapter 13 is when the blasphemous beast enters the story. So we hear a clip. So 
So um, the, the 12-tone row had been combined here with the other relevant motifs that, that occur in the story. For example, blasphemy comes out of, the, out of the beast's mouth, and the motif for mouth is to use octaves. So when, it comes, when blasphemy comes out of the mouth, it goes <laughs> blasphemy out of the mouth. Okay, then uh, blasphemy uh, lasts for 42 months in the story. So, so in the second sequence, there's 42 notes. Um, and, and so on, uh, six groups of seven. <clears throat> the, blast, the, the beast blasphemes God's name. And I told you the motif for name is a pedal point. And so, so we got. Oh, sorry. Anyway, that's pedal point. And so on. So uh, let's listen to let's listen to it again. Uh, you, you hear blasphemy now. the book of Revelation encompasses a huge variety of different events and emotion. No one style can appropriately represent that whole story. Therefore, Fantasia Apocalyptica is an eclectic mix of many, many styles. There's ancient Greek music, medieval chants, change ringing, Baroque counterpoint, Near Eastern folk music, shape note singing, spirituals, calypso, Romantic symphonies, chorales, combinatorial patterns, atonal music, jazz and Broadway, rock music, rap music. Uh, also, there's the music of ringtones in there. All of these styles actually work together as parts of a unified whole, thanks to the versatility of a pipe organ. <clears throat> By the way, I, I ran across a very nice quote from the 18th century while I was doing this work. <clears throat> Uh, Johann Matheson, uh, contemporary of Bach, <clears throat> says, borrowing is permissible, but copy work should be returned with interest. That is, one must present the imitated materials so that they achieve a more beautiful and, and improved aspect than they had in the original context. Even the greatest capitalists will borrow money if it is to their advantage or convenience. As I was as I was completing uh, more and more of this piece, I eventually began to imagine that somehow Fantasia Apocalyptica had already been written. Because, uh, uh, you know, somehow it, I, I was thinking it was already out there. My job was merely to listen to it as best I could. As soon as I heard what seemed right, I would hurry to transcribe it into musical notation before it had left my ears. Could it be that a muse of some sort was dictating notes in some way? That's unbelievable. Yet, I definitely did have magical transcendent moments while I was caught up in the project. I want to conclude by showing you an entire chapter so that you can get a, a better idea of the whole work. Uh, Revelation chapter 2 consists of four letters written to four early Christian churches, and it begins with a letter to the church in Ephesus. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, this is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven gold lampstands. My musical transcription uh, begins with a bugle call. That's the bugle call that's traditionally used as a church call in the US Army and uh, maybe also in the Canadian Army. When I was at summer camp as a child, I was called to church every Sunday morning by those notes. Uh, there's a nice way for me to put the city name Ephesus into the music here, because uh, ancient Greek musicians had a convention by which every letter of the alphabet represented an absolute musical pitch. Thus, Epsilon Phi Epsilon for Ephesus corresponded to Epsilon Phi Epsilon. 
you can look it up in the Unicode uh, 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 definition. <clears throat> After Epsilon, Phi Epsilon, my music continues then with the motifs for stars, and there are seven stars. So we turn on the Zimmerstern, um, <clears throat> and uh, golden lamp stands, uh, which is uh, uh, those chords you hear there. And uh, so here's how it sounds. I hope you can hear the little bells of the cymbal stern. At, at my age, I need hearing aids in order to hear them. Audio, please. Full chapter two contains a lot more music, of course, uh, and I'll, as we listen to it, I'll try to explain some of the highlights. Uh, let's start over at the beginning. So go back to the beginning of that clip, please. So um, that last haunting melody, it's actually one of the very earliest known songs. It goes back to about 128 BC. It was found carved on a rock at Delphi. I once learned an interesting algorithm for harmonizing any melody based on flipping a coin. And I've used that algorithm to generate the harmony here. The melody in the right hand, but the, the, the bass and and lower lines are, are, are done by, the, by this algorithm. Um, and uh, the coin flips that I, that I needed to control the algorithm, they come from the name Ephesus when it's expressed in Morse code. So as you'll see later, that same melody is going to occur over and over again. Uh, so when it occurs for another city, I use, an, I use another sequence of coin flips to get a different harmonization of the melody. So, you know, we're going to have Smyrna coming up next. So, so let's continue uh, where we left off. There. Now it's going to have a letter to Smyrna, begin with a church call, and the name of Smyrna. <clears throat>
fourth letter is to Thyatira. <clears throat> Can't resist, I can't resist telling you about the, uh, the seven notes that occurred in the middle there because it turns out this is precisely the melody you get when you take the name Jezebel and convert it to ancient Greek musical notation. Now Jezebel was a, a woman of Thyatira who called herself a prophetess <clears throat> and I, my motive for profit is contrary motion. So I could follow the name Jezebel by the same thing played upside down. Sorry. Okay, so look, it sounds better when it's played by a real musician here. So, uh, by the way, uh, Fantasia Apocalypta indeed turned out to be quite difficult to play. Too hard for me to get through any chapter without slowing down or making a lot of mistakes. So I decided, however, I decided early on uh, to write the music that seemed best to match the text and not to limit it by my own inadequacy as a performer. The audio clips that you've been hearing were made by Jan Overduen, a terrific organist who happens to live in Waterloo. I'm sure many of you know that he will be playing the North American premiere of Fantasia Apocalyptica next Sunday afternoon at the First United Church. Jan has, in fact, been posting eloquent little video clips for his Facebook friends with excerpts from the Fantasia for some time now. I want to play three of these short clips for you because he's a natural-born teacher, and his explanations are a lot clearer than mine. <clears throat> so here, for example, is the way he explains the brief letter to Pergamum, which comes in the middle of chapter two. Look, we have the video clip. <clears throat>
So here's another, um, next is a, another mini tutorial. This one, the letter to Smyrna. <clears throat> There's some pauses. Even in Silicon Valley, we have this when, we, when we're running Facebook. is the um, letter to Ephesus, which opens the chapter two. <clears throat> if you watch Jan's feet carefully, you'll, look, you'll see where he presses a little brown button above the pedal board at the far left. That button turns the cymbal stern on and off.
premiere of Fantasia Apocalyptica took place in January of this year on my 80th birthday. It was certainly one of the happiest occasions of my entire life. We were up in northern Sweden, the site of one of the world's finest modern pipe organs, and I was honored to have it performed by none other than Jan Overdun. I can't help thinking that God has been smiling on this project as more than 150 people traveled for the occasion. Everybody arrived and returned safely. <clears throat> Furthermore, a team of experts from Google actually came to film the event in 3D so that in years to come, we should be able to experience that memorable concert in virtual reality. Well, I can't immerse you in virtual reality today, but you can watch all 22 of those individual chapters in 3D via YouTube because th uh, they went online a couple weeks ago. 3D gives you the ability to choose any direction of viewing that you like as you're watching. The Google team also gave me a 2D version of chapter two so that I could show you tonight a, a, a sample of the premiere performance. So here now again for the last time tonight is the entire chapter two uh, this time, as it looked and sounded last January in Sweden. I hope it gives you a feeling for what I was trying to achieve when writing this fantasy.
Okay, so now um, I'm going to conclude then but just playing the uh, video that Jan made about the very final bars of Fantasia Apocalyptica. That they represent the, the, the last four verses of Revelation. Here I was able to fulfill my original goal of quoting from Paul Mons's wonderful anthem, In Song, Lord Jesus, Quickly Come. Um, and I proceed it with a final reprise of the Delphic Kim. So um, Jan tells me that at the final climax, where he just saw a man in great big letters, he's planning to pull out all the stops. 
and get as many pipes blowing as are going to fit in that cord. Maybe people will be able to hear it in Toronto. I worry a little bit that the audience might start to applaud at that point and that their applause might drown out the ascending amens that follow. To my knowledge, no piece of music has ever before ended in this way with notes getting higher and higher until only dogs can hear them. On Sunday, we're going to try to see if we can warn the audience to hold back. Okay, so I'm done. Thanks for listening. Thank you.